Okay, red button's on, so I think we're ready. Um, one thing I wanted to make note of, I'm in our um, trainings a grid here of all of our training sessions, and I did uh, create a small PowerPoint about the import. Um, thought maybe that might be something helpful to get you started um, when you do trainings with your districts on um, the import um, options underneath the system menu. So you guys can click on that and follow along with me. Um, and so, like I said, what we're gonna cover today is basically just the import option um, underneath system. And um, there's a lot of different things that you can do in here. And I know that I think in the documentation, we still have it marked as in draft mode because we are continually adding and, and changing things to that. Um, so um, one of these days we'll get that removed. Um, but what uh, you can do underneath the import is um, your districts can mass import or mass load um, new items. So if they get a batch of new Chromebooks or iPads or something like that, and um, they keep track of it, in inventory. I know some districts don't. Their tech department keeps track of it separately in their own spreadsheet, and that's fine. But I know some districts do, and they want to keep that information on the inventory system as well. And so um, they can. They can go in and do a mass update and, and mass load all of those Chromebooks in with all their model numbers and serial numbers. So that makes it really handy. Um, with something like that, especially that type of example, they probably get the spreadsheet from their tech department um, with all that information. So the spreadsheet that comes from their tech department may not be in the format that's needed to import it using our import option. So they definitely need to tweak it um, and make sure that the headers are correct on the spreadsheet and has the right required information. So we'll definitely go through a couple of, of examples of that and how to prepare your spreadsheet so that you can import it in. Um, we're also going to, um, another option that's available is updating existing information. So you've got tags already out there and you need to change the location on several tags. Um, you definitely can do that by going in and uh, extracting, I would highly recommend extracting that information out of the items grid and then go in and make those changes because everything's there. So it's wonderful. So it's got all the information. You go in and make the changes to, for example, the locations, and then you import it back in and uh, checking to update exist existing items. So we'll go through an example. I think I have a couple examples on that on how to do um, a mass change of location and of replacement cost and insurable values. Um, that's another popular one um, that they want to update existing items to increase those values. Another thing uh, that is available in our uh, system import option is the ability to add additional acquisitions to existing items. So those items have to exist already on the system before you can add additional acquisitions. This one probably isn't as popular. Um, and I don't know if that was even an option we had available in Classic anymore. Um, I don't think it was. Um, but you can do that in um, inventory. So if you have a spreadsheet of just acquisition information for specific items, um, we have um, the specs out there, the file layout. And once you follow that, you can go in and add those additional acquisitions to those existing items um, through the mass import. Uh, disposition. So this was a pretty popular one. We didn't really have a very nice way to do that in Classic, uh, but they can go in and mass dispose of items. So that doesn't remove them. That just creates a disposition transaction and also updates the related item to a disposed of status. So, um, but we will go through an example of that as well. And then also we have various uh, codes 
um, underneath core that can be mass added. So um, this might be a good example of a district that is starting new in inventory and they have a bunch of location categories to add. So why not use a spreadsheet? If they've got that information laid out on a spreadsheet, you can mass import that. Um, a lot of the other options under core, fund, function, asset class, probably aren't that many that they need to add. So manually adding them is probably the way to go, but we do have those out there in case um, they do want to use a spreadsheet to mass load those codes. Um, I think um, one of the biggest things in regards to the um, codes maybe is let's say they do go in and they mass add a bunch of items, okay? And those codes don't already exist on file. So what happens is when that item gets added and it looks for that location code and it's not out there, it creates the location code automatically. But if you go and look at that location code afterwards in core, it's going to say something in the description like user imported. It's obviously because there's no description that was included when you mass added the item um, for that location. Um, so in that kind of situation, you could, after you get all of those, you know, items added, and let's say you look out underneath core and location, and you've got a bunch of location co codes out there, but they say user imported on them. That's something where you can extract that information out of the location grid, add the proper descriptions, and then mass load them back in and update those descriptions. So it's just kind of a way of just, you know, cleaning that up. Um, so, you know, it's, it's another reason why you may use the, you know, those um, various codes underneath core to do some mass importing. Okay. With all of these imports that you're doing, um, they're, they all have to be in a CSV format. So you may be working in an Excel spreadsheet, and I recommend working in an Excel spreadsheet. The reason being, a lot of your codes, your tag numbers, have leading zeros. So it, let's say you go in and you have a big spreadsheet with, you know, a bunch of fun codes, 001, a bunch of tags that have maybe a few leading zeros ahead of the tag number, and you're, it's not formatted to be in text, and you go and you save that um, Excel spreadsheet as a CSV file, and then you go and realize that you missed something. So you go and open the CSV file, guess what? Those fields, those leading zeros are lost, they're gone. So your fun code is now just gonna be a one. So if you go in and try to import that CSV file with just a one, it's going to create a code one. Um, so um, I would, you know, work in the Excel spreadsheet for as much as you can before you're actually ready to do an import. Once you have finalized that spreadsheet, you know, you've gone in and out of it, saving it as an Excel spreadsheet. Once you're done, you're like, okay, I'm ready to import this in, um, then save it as a CSV file. And don't open that CSV file. If you still need to make changes, go back to the Excel. Um, but um, save it as a CSV file, and then you have to import it in using that CSV format. Um, all of our required fields that are needed in order to successfully import items, um, as well as the file layouts, are in our documentation. And so we're going to go into there here in a little bit and talk about all of that. So um, also we have uh, template spreadsheets out there um, that you guys can use. Um, so and your districts can use. So if they're like, you know, wanting to um, create a new spreadsheet of new items, use the template spreadsheet. Um, it has all of the required headers as well as all of the other, you know, non-required ones. And it even has little definitions. If you scroll on the header um, of each, it'll say, you know, whether it's required and just gives a little definition of what that field is for. Um, so those, I'll show you where those are all at here as soon as we get into the documentation. So um, let's go in there now, check that out. 
Okay, so in our system um, documentation here, where we're going is into the import option. And here are all of the different ways that we just kind of briefly went over of what you can import. So like I said, item, acquisitions, dispositions. Um, you can't, you guys are like, where's transfers? You can't mass import transfers. That's the only other transaction, you know, that um, option that I uh, think about, um, but there isn't a way to do a mass import of transfer transactions. Um, and then all of our different codes. So those are all of our different import types. Um, and so if I kind of scroll down here, it goes in and, you know, it kind of explains that again and then takes us through the actual um, option, like the menu that you see. And this will change depending on the item import type you select. So right now it's just item. Um, but you'll see um, when I select disposition, a lot of this stuff won't be in there because it's, you know, your your mass, you're actually updating existing items. So you don't need a new auto assigned tag for a disposition. Um, the item's already out there. You're just disposing of it. Um, so yeah, like I said, this menu will change depending on the import type that you select. And so if I scroll back up here, I'm just going to go right to our item import because this is our import criteria. So it takes me right to the file layout. And so it gives us some good information here up at the top, just telling you what happens when you do um, import or load a new item. Um, basically, when you have a spreadsheet of new items that are not on the system, once you import those, it will create a transaction and that item is going to be listed underneath the transactions items grid. So you're going to see that there. And also it creates a trans an acquisition transaction at the same time. So you need an acquisition and an item. So every time you create an item, it should have a related acquisition. And so this just first paragraph just kind of explains that. Um, that uh, this is what you're going to need to do. Um, and also you'll note um, here that also it says um, only limited data will be stored on the associated acquisition record. And that's true because what happens is um, what happens is uh, you don't have, when you're when you're loading an item spreadsheet, you don't have a column for the purchase order or the check number or the PO date or anything like that. And so when you've got all the information about the item in there, so when you uh, import that item and it creates that related acquisition at the same time, that acquisition record is only going to include the transaction number, because it's the same as the item transaction, the acquisition date, and the amount, so which is the original cost. The acquisition amount is going to be the same as the original cost. Um, and so anything else outside of that, you would have to go in, if they want like the PO number stored on there, the account code that was used to purchase the item, if they want that information on there, after they create the item, they can go into the acquisition grid and extract those acquisitions, enter in the detailed information, the PO, the account code, all of that, and then re-import and update those existing acquisitions if they want to do that. Now, obviously, when you're creating an item through the items uh, option, you know, through the application, um, it will allow you to pull from the pending file and it will fill in all that information, right? When you're doing creating an item manually. But when you're in a spreadsheet, um, those type of things aren't going to be filled in automatically when you create an item via a spreadsheet. Some of that acquisition information won't be allowed to be put in there. So, you know, they have the option afterwards of going in 
extracting those acquisitions out, fill in the nece necessary information and plug it back in. Um, so that's kind of what that second sentence is, is talking about um, and, the, and the third sentence there. Um, updating existing items. Um, uh, like I said before, if you need to update existing items, I would strongly recommend letting the system do the work for you by going in and using the export grid items to extract those items. Um, and it will have all the information in there for you. So then you just tweak what you need to um, in um, Excel and then go ahead and save those changes and re-import it back in and it will update those items. So um, that's a, a, a very good tip right there. Um, and then it just goes in and discusses all the different fields, whether they're required or not, that can be on the spreadsheet. So you'll see here, um, record underscore ID. So that is required. Um, it must contain an I for item. So your first column on that new spreadsheet that you are going to um, start creating must have an I. So you can take that I and carry that all the way down the column uh, for all the lines of items that you're going to add. And, um, and so then it just goes through. So you do have to be careful here when you're, um, you know, if you're creating this from scratch and not using the template, which is right up here, here's our template spreadsheet you can download. So like I said, this has all of these fields in here in the proper formats. But if you're using, you know, entering one from scratch, um, you have to be careful that the field names are what you see here. So inventory underscore tag, you have to have that. You can't just have tag when you're importing items. Um, it won't, you'll get an error uh, when you're trying to import them. So this goes through and tells you the fields that are uh, that you can import in, which ones are required or bolded. Um, just a little uh, definition of or formatting information about that field. So an inventory tag can't be more than 20 characters, basically. Um, and so, and then just a little bit more of here, the, here's where the definition is, is what is this, you know, column used for? Um, and explains it here in the definition. Um, and so we have these file layouts, like I said, for item imports, for acquisition imports. Again, we have another spreadsheet template um, and then just some information about acquisition imports. And here's the file layouts. And you'll note too, it has um, an informational message here the item must exist first if you're going to import additional acquisitions against that item. Here is the disposition import. So again, we have a spreadsheet already set up for that that you can download and work off of. Um, and then also the information about the disposition. And then all of our code ones. So like I was saying before, some of these you may never use because um, they only have a handful of, let's say, asset class codes. So if you've got a brand new district starting up in inventory and they only have five asset classes, you could do a spreadsheet, but it might be just as easy as going into the application and creating the asset classes there. Um, so the one, like I said, that might be pretty popular underneath here is probably the location codes. Your districts could have a ton of location codes out there. Um, and if they're starting new in inventory, you can set up a spreadsheet of all of those and mass import those in. So here are all the different ones. And then we just have down at the bottom of this, and we'll add more to this, but it's just uh, maybe some messages or errors you might encounter on the resulting import report. So when you go in to actually create or, or submit um, an actual spreadsheet and import mass import items, you'll get a resulting import results file afterwards, explaining, you know, kind of giving you a, a clue as to whether the item did successfully import or if it encountered errors. So some of those errors are listed here. Um, so that is a work in progress, definitely this area. 
So like I said, this is kind of where you need to go when you are ready to actually start working on this. And this is definitely a place uh, that you want to refer to your districts to help them set up um, their spreadsheets. Any questions about the actual import um, documentation here? Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to test some of these out here and try them out and kind of walk through some of these with you. I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint here. And so um, what we're going to start off with first is um, the most popular one is going in and creating spreadsheet of new items that you want to mass load in. And so when you select, I've got a, kind of got a screenshot of what it looks like when you select the item import type. And so basically, once you select this, the menu down here might change a little bit. Um, and so if I am going, if I have a spreadsheet of new items, I want to load into my inventory. Um, I want to make sure that the uncheck update records, that the update records box is unchecked. Um, I'm not updating existing items. I'm creating new ones. Um, so you want to make sure that that isn't checked. Um, create transfers. That's really more for um, if you have an existing um, item out there and you change the fund function or asset class on it, on the spreadsheet, and you want to transfer transaction created for that. So these are for your, know, your districts that have gap enabled. Um, and so you can uh, definitely click on the create transfers and it will create a transfer transaction as well as updating that fund function or asset class on the item. Uh, keeping the leading zeros. So obviously if you've got items with leading zeros and a lot of uh, districts do um, on, on their item number, um, you can keep that checked. And then you have the auto assign down here as well. Um, oops, so for those, um, if for some reason you miss something on the spreadsheet, doesn't contain a tag number, one of your lines on your spreadsheet, if the auto assign tag is checkmarked um, and you can put in a prefix tag number, like no tag, um, and then put in a starting actual tag number on it. And what happens then is when you create, when you uh, load that spreadsheet in, it will create the tags for you based off of your prefix and your starting number. So if, you know, like I said, you have a line on there that doesn't have a tag number, it's basically going to create a tag called no tag one, two, three, four for the first one. Um, so that's, basically what that's used for. That was something that was included in the classic um, EISIX option. And so uh, we have that same option available here. Um, otherwise, if that you do have a line on your spreadsheet that doesn't contain a tag, obviously that line will not import in. You'll get an error um, on the import results file. And that'll be easy to, to see, right? Because you'll see, well, why didn't it load? And then you go back to the spreadsheet and you look and say, oh, because I didn't have a tag number in there. Um, and so um, so it's not going to stop the thing from, you know, completely not um, importing. It's going to give you that error. Um, so if, you know, your districts, and I think a lot of districts have their gap flag enabled. Um, whether they're on gap or not, some of them just have that gap flag ena enabled. And what happens is um, there are security restrictions then, or not security, but just restrictions as to regards of um, being on gap um, that are kind of forced on the system. So one thing is um, if your gap flag is enabled, it's going to create an item and the associated acquisition record at the same time. Um, it is going to require a fund fund um, fund function and asset class to be in there. It's going to require the original cost in there. Um, so, um, and that stuff is ex is explained in the documentation. But I think uh, most districts that were on Gap in Classic, when you migrate it over, um, it set it up in inventory already that you're already on Gap as well. 
And where to see that is in the configuration menu. When you go into configuration, it'll say gap enabled up at the top, um, just to let you know that, you know, you're, it's already, they're already on gap. Let's see, we talked about the required fields uh, that must be included on the spreadsheet. Um, all date formats are accepted. I don't think we really have any issues with that. Um, and one other, th and one big thing, when it comes to using the import option underneath system is that um, those dates, the acquisition dates have to be within an open period. So if my only open period is 2024, um, 23 is closed, and I have a spreadsheet of dates within fiscal year 23, I try to load those in, I'm going to get an error because that period is closed. So that date has to be within an open period. Now, with that being said, our system configuration migration import option that's only admin access uh, can be used to mass import archived year items or closed items. Um, and really this is intended for those districts that did not migrate over that are starting new because they'll have a spreadsheet of 200 items with several different years of acquisition dates, right? They may have some from 1975 on there. And it's because it's like a building or something that they've had since then. They wanna import that in. Well, obviously we can't create um, years in underneath core for those archived years, but we can import those items using the system configuration migration import option. Um, but this should only be used for those districts that are starting a new on inventory. Now, we have had like little workarounds with uh, problems um, or questions at tickets that you guys have had where the workaround was having you guys go in and use the migration import to make updates. And that's okay, um, that's our workaround for you guys, but it's not something we wanna get into the habit of doing, right? Um, so these are just, you know, when it comes to your new district starting up, you definitely have to use the migration import to import all those in. Um, but for those that have already migrated over, unless there's a problem, with something and they can't import the item using the regular system import, or if there's another uh, problem, um, then we may recommend that you guys use the system configuration migration import to make those updates. And that will be noted on the tickets. So otherwise uh, we don't, you know, once you guys going in there and just mass adding old, you know, items because they forgot to do that, you know, when they migrated over from EIS. So um, we have steps in the uh, documentation on what to do if they have an item that needs to be added from, you know, a couple of years ago. They can go in and add it normally now with an acquisition date in the current year in 2024, let's say. Um, and then they can do um, an error adjustment on that item to show that this really was something that should have been added a couple of years ago. Um, that just, that error adjustment flag just indicates that. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run through a couple examples of loading um, some new items. These are new items. We've got new iPads, we have new cafeteria equipment. And the reason why I picked both of these, one has capitalized assets, which is the cafeteria equipment, and one has non-cap items. So what I wanna do is take you through, um, we'll go start with the iPads first um, and load those non-cap items. Um, and then take a look at the items afterwards, make sure that they loaded okay. And then um, the second round here, we're gonna load some cafeteria equipment that's all capitalized. Once we um, import that, we'll take a look at those items as well. And we'll also run some gap reports. So you can see 
where they are, because they're uh, now capitalized, they should, should be showing up on the acquisition column to show that, you know, they're part of new assets that were added this year. Um, so that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to go back to my window here. And go into my district. And um, let me see here. I'm going to pull up my spreadsheet of the iPads. So this is where I was talking about an example of you get some spreadsheet from your tech department and they're like, here you go. Here's uh, all of these iPads that um, they have on their spreadsheet um, that you want to load into inventory. So chances are their spreadsheet and their spreadsheet headers aren't going to look like yours, right? Um, that need to be formatted in. So basically what you need to do is take a look at the information that they have on their spreadsheet and make some updates um, in order for it to format correctly. And so I'm gonna just expand upon this a little bit. Um, and so their spreadsheet might've come in as no record ID. Um, they could have just had something called tag up here. Um, obviously they may not have any of this stuff. And if it isn't needed, you don't keep track of this stuff, then no problem. You know, you don't need to add those columns just to add them. Those can be deleted. Um, they might just have, um, I don't know, description or definition up here. So here's where you need to look at the file layout in the import um, documentation for the item import and make sure that your header records are correct so that it loads correctly. And so, um, and also they, they probably definitely have model number and serial number and stuff like that on there. And that's great. Um, but what I would do is just go in, I'm going to pull up my inventory on this screen here, my inventory documentation. And I'm going to go to the system. And I'm going to go right to the item import. I'm going to kind of slide this over a little bit. And so I'm basically just checking out that these fields here match the header records up here and that I have all of the required. So if they're, this spreadsheet coming from your tech department just has tag, you need to change this. So it says inventory tag on there um, and so, so on and so forth. So, and then anything that's required needs to be on here. X out of that. And uh, so, you know, um, I've already kind of prepared us for that. And I went in and, you know, made the changes and making sure that each one of these has the proper, um, I think I did, <laughs> has the proper field definition. And so I'm just kind of scrolling through here, checking it out. And obviously, you know, like I said, for those that don't have, you um, data in there, you don't have to include them. I can just get rid of this if I want to. And I don't use the organizational units. So I'm going to delete that um, altogether. I don't, it's not a required field, so um, I don't need it on here. Um, so one thing I want to make sure of, um, it, as well as, you know, making sure that my leading zeros are in here, okay. Um, if my tag numbers have leading zeros, I want to make sure that those all have leading zeros, which they do. Um, and the other thing I wanna make sure of is that my acquisition date falls in an open period. I think in my data, um, 22 is the open and um, current year for um, inventory. So I just wanna slide over to my acquisition dates and make sure that they're within fiscal year 22, which they are. Uh, they're all September 14th. 2021. So that's in fiscal year 22. Um, they also have depreciation tracked. And so again, my depreciation date should probably be my acquisition date. Uh, we shouldn't get too crazy on those and they definitely shouldn't be in a prior year um, or in a future year. Uh, they should be within that month of your acquisition date. I've got some life limits on here and that's it. I, you know, I've got my straight line 
These aren't leases. So I think I'm good to go. Got everything set up the way I need it to be. And so, you know, like I said, you want to work out of the spreadsheet. So if you're in the middle of this and you need to leave, you want to start again tomorrow, save it as an Excel spreadsheet. And then once you're ready and you know it's good to go, then what you're going to do is you're going to go in and save this as a CSV file. So I'm going to go up to file, save as, and I'm going to change it as a CSV. And I'm going to go ahead and save that. And so from there, then I am going to go in to my import. So I'm going to go up to system and item import, or I'm sorry, import. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and upload that file that I just saved. And again, I'm checking, yep, it's the CSV file I want. And then I want to make sure I have my import type selected. It's item. I want to load these items in. Um, I don't want to update a record. I'm creating new records. It's a new record. I don't have any transfer transactions. Um, I do want it to keep the leading zeros. And I didn't have any items that did not contain a, a tag number. So I'm going to ignore the auto assigned information. And I'm going to go ahead and import this. And you can name it whatever you want. Um, you can just call it import results if you want to. I'm going to override the one I already have there. Now let's take a look. And so this looks perfect. Um, may not always look this way, um, but um, it tells me what happened. It's telling me that an acquisition record and an item record was created for each of the tags on my spreadsheet. So at this point then, I wanna check these out. And what I normally do is I write down the first one and the last one, 086826 is my last one, and 086807 is my first one. And then I go back in and I wanna go first down to items. And what I can do as well is if I don't want to fill out the whole thing, I can basically, this is all of the ones you notice um, on our filtering, I can just type in 0868 and it pretty much shows everything. If I want to narrow it down, just the first one I can. But um, here is the information um, that I have out here. These are the columns that I selected on my grid. But if I want to look at everything, I'm just going to go into that first one and view that item record and just make sure um, these were definitely under our threshold. This threshold for this district is um, $1,000 and zero life. So these definitely fall under the threshold. So they should not have capitalized checked, which it doesn't. Um, and then I'm just kind of looking through here. My serial and model numbers loaded in okay. My description did. I'm just kind of going through. Here is the fun function and asset class that I had on the spreadsheet. This is a district that where gap is enabled. And I'm just kind of going down, making sure that my um, original cost is out there. And I definitely want to make sure the beginning balance is not the same as my original cost. This is a brand new item. If this was a capitalized asset, the beginning balance should be zero as well. And why it's more important with the capitalized asset is because beginning balance means it was a capitalized asset at the beginning of the year. This didn't come on until this year. So if this was a capitalized asset, that beginning balance field will not get set until I close this year. So the amount of that item will show up on my gap schedules underneath the acquisition column but it should not be on the beginning balance until I close for the year. And then that makes sense, right? Because then in the next year, this item is capitalized and should be included as part of the beginning balance for the new year. Um, so if I scroll down here, here's my depreciation information. 
Um, again, I'm looking beginning date. Yep, matches the acquisition date. That looks great. And so again, depreciation won't get tracked until I close for the year. So right now my life to date should be zero because I don't have any, I just added this. Um, so once I close the year, this will be updated and there will be an internal adjustment listed here for um, that first year of depreciation. So I didn't have anything underneath lease on that spreadsheet, so that all looks good. So the item looks good, but what I wanna do is also check out the acquisition. And I do not wanna go into add acquisition. I'm not adding a new acquisition. I wanna look at the existing acquisition that was added when I did the import. So I'm gonna close out of here and I'm gonna go up to acquisitions and again, type in that in 086, oops. Eight six and um, here are all the ones, and here is where I was telling you guys that when you're doing a mass import, obviously a lot of this information is missing. So let me click on this first one. We can talk about this further. And so, like I said, what is going to be included when you do a mass import is the tag number, the type by default is acquisition, the date and the amount. Now it's going to pull the fund function and asset class from the item and display it in here as well. Um, but you know, there is no account code because there was nowhere on the spreadsheet to add that, right? There is no PO number because I didn't have that on my item spreadsheet. So if this is something, like I said, where the district wants to add this information, um, now that I've got these filtered, I can do an export grid items um, extract the acquisition spreadsheet, add that information in, and then I would, once I have that done and I add all those account codes and purchase order numbers and check numbers, what I can do is go back into system, into the import, use the acquisition option, make sure update records is selected, upload that file, import, and it will go out there then and fill in all that information, update all that information in those acquisition records. So all of that will be populated in here. So that's, you know, I know it's an extra step, but um, if that's something that they need and they want to have in there, um, then that's uh, the option that they're going to have to take. So, okay. So we've got our first one. And we, like I said, um, I can also check out that last tag number I had, 086826. I'm gonna looking at the acquisition record first this time. It all looks good, 27054. And then I could go into the transaction, into the item, and go down to that one again and just view it if I wanted to and make sure that everything looks good, looks good to me. So I, as far as I'm concerned, this imported in successfully. And my import results file pretty much told me that I have no errors. All right, we're gonna try another one here. If you have any questions while I'm loading up this other one, please feel, to put, feel free to put it in the chat. And so my next one, I'm gonna go, is, let's see, I've got some capitalized information. I have some equipment. Um, so new kitchen inventory. So again, this is an Excel spreadsheet that I've been working on. And so these are all of the um, items that I have on here. So let's kind of take a look again. I've got my record ID. I've got my inventory tag. If I put in a tag that already exists on this system, um, obviously I'm gonna get an error when I try to import this, um, saying this tag number is already used or something um, to indicate that uh, you can't add this in because you can only have one tag um, number on the system. So I kind of go through here as well and look through everything, kind of look through all of my information here, making sure that everything is set up. I want to make sure that my acquisition date, again, is in this open period of fiscal year 22, and it is. Here's my original cost information. These are all over $1,000. So 
So they should be um, capitalized assets once I import them in. Also my depreciation information, which is the same date as my acquisition date. So that all looks good. And so at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and um, save this as a CSV file. And now I'm gonna go back to my application. Get rid of this one. And I'm gonna go up to system, import. And again, I wanna upload that file. And it's my new kitchen CSV file here. And it's again, a new item. So this needs to be unchecked. This needs to be unchecked. I did have leading zeros. I want to make sure that those are retained. And so at this point then, I'm going to go ahead and import this. Let's see what we get. I'm going to try to keep one results file here. <laughs> oh, the old one. Okay. So again, I, I got lucky with this one, no errors. Um, and again, it's telling me that it added both the acquisition and the item information for each one of these tags. So you're, you're always going to see two lines, one for the acquisition, one for the item for each tag that you imported in. Um, and so again, if I wanna jot these down, 076114. One other thing I wanted to do, if I go back to that uh, spreadsheet, is um, I want to total up the spreadsheet to see what the acquisition amount is, uh, because I want to compare that against my gap report. And um, if this, and again, if this is um, the only um, items I've added so far, you know, for this fund, function, or asset class, I'll be able to compare those balances to make sure that they're the same. So I'm going to go over to my original cost and I'm going to go, I'm going to change this to number here. And I'm going to go ahead and auto sum this. So it says here, and that's not right. I'm going to try that again. Maybe it is from 2 to 17. So this is the number it says that it's going to be uh, 107, 182. Um, and so uh, when I run my GIP reports, I'm going to see um, if, you know, I'm going to try to run it by I'm going to pick on the 006. I'm going to run it by fund and pick on the 006 fund. I don't know if these files, they've had other capitalized assets added for the 006, but I'm hoping um, we can kind of see, get lucky here and see if that's the amount that shows up. Um, got a question here. Can the import template be modified to include the PO number vendor so you don't have to go back in? As of now, that's a good question, Darby, but uh, no. Um, the item import will not be able to handle those. Um, so you will have to, you know, the acquisition import spreadsheet has that. Um, so you will have to do that extra step. But, um, I, you know, we can see if that could be maybe something possible um, to add um, as a future enhancement. So um, I'll make sure to jot that down and see if maybe that's something that can be done. Okay, so, so I said 107, 182, I'm gonna write that down. And like I said, our imports seem to load all of those. Okay, I don't have any errors on any others. So now let's go check some of these out here. So I'm gonna go back and go to items. And let's see, 072. And there's our first one, 072610. 
And I'm going to go ahead and uh, view this. And so, uh, again, I'm looking just to make sure that, you know, the fields that I had on my spreadsheet were filled in. Um, and also to make sure that this is capitalized because it met the threshold and that capitalized is checked. Um, my original cost was 2211. Again, should not have a beginning balance. That won't populate until I close this year. Um, here's my beginning date, which is my beginning depreciation date, which is the same as my acquisition date. So yeah, everything looks good on this. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the acquisition as well. And I'm going to look at this. And again, just to confirm that... You know, one thing I, I didn't look at last time was making sure that this is checkmarked. This should always be checkmarked when you're doing an import of items and the acquisition gets created at the same time. You want whatever amounts that are on those acquisitions to update the original cost. So that should be checked by default. Stuff from the spreadsheet got pulled over. So this all looks good. And so um, the last thing I'm going to do is I could check the ending number on that, but um, I know there were random numbers on that spreadsheet. What I'm going to do is I'm just to save us some time. I'm just going to go ahead and jump in and run. Um, I'm going to pick on the schedule of changed and fixed assets because I want to see if these were added. They, you know, they were marked as capitalized. Um, and I'm going to run it by the default fund. And I'm going to pick on that 006 fund and take a look at that. And I'm just going to go look at the summary um, and see what my totals are. And so um, I do have, here is um, my 006 fund here. And I do have, um, I'm not sure if all of them are 006, but I do see an acquisition mount of 105, 332. I know mine was 107, 182. It might be that some of this might be on another. I can't remember all of them, but it is showing up on that acquisition amount field or column. So that's where it should be. It should not be part of the beginning balance because it wasn't an item at the beginning of the year for this uh, fiscal year. Um, and then what will happen then is, you know, obviously beginning balance plus acquisitions minus any disposed of assets during the year, um, plus or minus transfer in or transfer out amounts, plus or minus any adjustment amounts equals the ending balance. So th this, any acquisitions are now included in the ending balance. And then this will move forward then in the new fiscal year as part of the beginning balance. Okay. So we ran through steps on how to do an, a new item import. Like I said, you can use that template we have out there in the documentation. Um, create your own if you want to, um, but um, I think that template will will help the districts out. Or if you know they do reset receive stuff from their tech department, then they can use the uh, file import layout to verify and make sure that they have the correct headers up there. Do some minor changing in that Excel spreadsheet. Once it's good to go, then they can go in and load those in. So the next thing I want to talk about is um, updating items. So um, we just created new items. What if we want to go in and update existing items? So when you do that, um, the update records must be checked to update those existing items. If you have changes in the fund function or asset class, um, you want to make sure that the create transfers is checked as well, because it will go out there and create a transfer transaction. And also, you know, it's going to update the existing fund function and asset class on that item. Um, the item, the ID column is required when updating existing items. And we do have that noted in the documentation as well. Um, so the best way, obviously the only way to get that ID column 
um, and also to save you lots of time is to extract those items out of the items grid. So if you have a bunch of items on there that you need to change the location on them, use the items grid and extract those, filter down to what you need, extract those, and then when you do, the ID column will be included. You don't want to change that ID column. You don't want to remove it. You don't want to go in and edit it. You just want to leave it alone. Um, that's the key ID um, that relates back to that item. So we just leave it out there. And then once we make the changes that we need to, we're going to go in and import and update um, those existing items. So I just have a note here, and these are just tips about being careful when you're updating existing items. Um, all the columns on that spreadsheet are going to overwrite existing data. So whatever columns you have on that spreadsheet, um, and you don't remove any of those columns, um, then it's going to overwrite whatever's in there um, when you import that in. And that's fine if you didn't make any changes. Um, let's say you know you extracted everything out, um, and you didn't make any changes to location codes. Let's say you updated replacement cost and insurable values. So that's okay. When you import it back in, it's going to be the same location code, right? It didn't change. So it's basically overwriting the same information, which is fine. Um, it's just that if you accidentally, um, you know, inadvertently change data on a spreadsheet that should not have been updated, if that change remains on the spreadsheet and you go in and import it, guess what? It's going to change it. It's going to overwrite it. So one thing you can do, or districts can do if they feel real nervous about that, is to get rid of the columns they don't want to change. So we'll talk about that when we go in and import it. Um, obviously, you can't delete the inventory tag column. You need that in order to update it. And you can't delete the record ID column. You need that. Um, but you know, if they're afraid while they're in there working that they might, you know, accidentally change, you know, the fund function asset class or an amount or something, um, then they can just remove those entire columns off of the spreadsheet and just include the columns they want to update. So you could be left with the record ID, the ID, the inventory tag, and the location. Those could be your only columns. You make the changes on those locations. You save it. You import it. That's okay. It's not going to erase all the other stuff because you did not have that column on the spreadsheet. It's just going to update the columns you have on your spreadsheet. So, so that's one thing that they can do. So here's where I talk about the grid extract. So let the system do the work for you. So they just go in, um, filter is the key. Um, so one thing to let you know is, you know, export using the Excel option to retain leading zeros. If you have a bunch of items with leading zeros, um, then a bunch of tags here with leading zeros, you save it as a CSV file, and then you open it up in Excel, the leading zeros are gone. So that's just a tip is to use the Excel option um, to retain those leading zeros and then make the changes in your Excel spreadsheet and then save it as a CSV before you load it back in. Um, one other thing is you'll notice my grid just has tag number, description, status, location, and acquisition. That's all my grid is showing. But when I use that export grid items and pull it, create a spreadsheet out of it, the spreadsheet is going to include all fields on the item, not just the ones in my grid. So here I have an example of, you know, I went in and filtered by this location. And even though I only have one, two, three, four, five columns on my grid, when I go and open up that spreadsheet, I have everything. So everything's in here. And like I said, if you just want to change just the location code, you can. You can go right over into that spreadsheet 
and change your locations, save it and load it in. And basically the same information in here is going to overwrite, you know, what's already out there. So it's not going to change anything on these other fields, but you also have the option of getting rid of a lot of these columns if you want to, and just have the location, like I said, inventory item, the ID and the record ID, make those changes and load it in and it will just update the location code because the rest of these columns are not in your spreadsheet. So it's not going to affect those. Okay, so we're gonna run through, I think we'll run through one example. I didn't think I'd go over an hour, um, but we do have a couple other things to talk about. So I'll go through updating those replacement costs and insurable values. Um, but again, you didn't do the same steps when mass changing location codes too. Um, so again, what I would want to do is I would want to make sure that I use my grid to get this information. And so I'm basically going to go in back into my application here and go into my items grid. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for my asset class of my information that I want to filter on. And I definitely want just active items. And in here, what I want to do is I want to update uh, replacement costs, maybe an insurable values on some of these. So I can filter as much as I need to. And then I'm going to export. And then those are the only items that will appear on my grid or on my spreadsheet, I'm sorry. And so I've done that already. So I'm gonna go and pull that up. Got my vehicles right here. Okay. Um, and so this is my extract that was created from that. So I see, you know, I wanna leave this ID column alone. I've got, you know, my inventory tag here. I've got all the information. So like I said, even though I didn't have these many columns on my grid, they're all going to appear in my spreadsheet. And so if I'm just going in and updating the replacement costs and insurable values, uh, that's great. That's all I need to do. I don't need to mess with the rest of this. I can leave it alone. Or if I'm nervous, I'm in here doing a lot of changes and I only want to include the columns that I'm going to change. I would need to totally delete the columns I'm not going to change from my from my spreadsheet. Um, in our example, to save us some time here, I'm going to show you uh, what I'm going to do. And you're like, okay, what if I have, what if this is like, you know, 200 items? How can I quickly increase my replacement cost and insurable values by, let's say, 3%? So what I can do is I'm going to insert a column <clears throat> behind each of these. And what I want to do is, and I am not an Excel guru by any means. This is the way I do this. Somebody else could have a better <laughs> option. But what I'm basically wanting to do is take my existing replacement costs. I'm going to make these wider so they're easier to see here. Um, and I'm going to increase this by 3%. So I'm doing this totally for insurance purposes. I want to increase the value of what happens if I would need to replace this, or if I have it insured, I want to increase the cost of the value of my insurance against this item. So what I can do is I can say equals, and what is this, N2 times 1.03%. So what I've done basically is taking the base value of this and increased it by 3%. And so that formula is right here and I can drag that down to the rest of mine. And um, I don't have any in here, which, okay. <laughs> and then uh, I test data. And then I'm gonna do the same thing with this one. And I'm gonna say equals, and that's gonna be P2 times, 1.3%, and then I'm gonna take that and carry that down. Okay, so before I save this though, 
I have to make sure that this replacement cost uh, header row is now populated in my new updated values. I can leave this go. It's not going to do anything because there is no header. So it's going to totally ignore anything that's in here. And I'm going to do the same thing with the insurable values. And again, this column has no header in it. So again, these will be ignored. So these are basically my new replacement cost and insurable value amounts. And so at this point then, um, I'm gonna go ahead and save this as a CSV file. And then I'm gonna go in and update this. So I'm back in my instance and um, I'm gonna go in and, and these are the three that are gonna get updated. I don't think I have insurable loads over here. So I'm gonna go ahead and make changes to these. Um, and I think I may have already done that in my test yesterday. So I think we're gonna see the same values, but at least we'll go through the process. Sorry about that. Um, import. And I'm gonna go ahead and do an upload. And here's the CSV file that I just did, updated. And then I'm gonna go in and the item, update records. I didn't make any changes to fund function and asset classes. So I'm gonna uncheck that, but I do wanna make sure my update records is, is there. And I'm gonna go ahead and click on import. And it should tell me these were all the items on there. Um, these items didn't have any amounts, so it didn't do anything on these, uh, but these first three did. And so again, if I go back then and look up these items then, let me pick on that first one here, 006783. So my insurable values and my replacement costs have been increased. They were the same amount as my original cost and I have changed those. So, um, so they have been increased by that. Um, and that's, and you'll notice everything else is still there. It didn't clear anything. Um, those fields were already on the spreadsheet, but that's okay, same values. They just updated over the same thing. Um, but like I said, if you just want to avoid any accidentally overwriting something you didn't need to, you could get rid of those columns. Okay. And that's, uh, you know, an easy way to go in and update replacement costs and insurable values by doing some type of formula. Obviously, if you were going in and updating locations, you would again, pull those out, edit the location category, and room number information on the spreadsheet because they're separate columns, make those changes and then save those and import it in and it will update them. So one thing too with this, if I would pick on the audits report now, I'm gonna run an audits report for today. You know, one way to confirm that um, all of that was updated is by looking at the, the tag. And another way to confirm that is by going in and um, is by going in and looking at the replacement cost. These are some of the items that I added. So you aren't really very familiar or not comfortable yet with the audit report. Um, just I want to kind of just stop here for a minute, just to kind of explain. Um, I'm just doing a search on replacement cost, but when I look at the replacement cost for this particular item, this item was added. This was one of the items I imported in um, that was a new item. So that's why it says add. If I go and update an item, 
it's going to say mod for modify. So I can go through here. It's probably near the end here. All should be by the time, which we are working on changing the time on that stuff. So sorry for scrolling, but it should be down at the bottom. Here we go. So here is where I went in and modified those items. So here's an example of one of them. And, uh, you know, and so basically it's saying at this particular time, this person went in and modified something on the item record. It doesn't tell you what program you used. I don't think UCS and payroll do that either. It just show, it tells you on the item record, we made a modification to this tag. And what we did is we updated the replacement cost to a new value. So that's kind of what, you know, the way you're going to see that. For a brand new item, when you add an item, it goes from null to the new value. And I know we have some things in here that we're still working on. Um, I know there's some uh, certain things that are missing um, on some of these. I noticed the fund and function, it doesn't have the new fund and function I added when I added that item. So just stuff like that. I know the programmers um, are aware of that stuff. So we are still working out kinks and stuff on the audit report. Um, but it does give you some good information here as to what happened. All right. Um, the acquisition import type. So we went through items. We went through adding new items and we went through updating existing items. Another thing that you can do is go in and add additional acquisitions against existing items. So this is kind of a screenshot of what that looks like when you want to do that. Um, you would go in and create your acquisition file, your spreadsheet, save it as a CSV file and upload it in here. And then from there, if they're brand new items, you're going to, or acquisition, sorry, you're going to have to select the acquisition import type and make sure update records isn't checked. And it will go out there and create those additional acquisitions against those items. Now, if you're wanting to go in and, um, update existing acquisitions. So that would be the example that we talked about earlier when I did a bunch of item imports and it you know, created the basic information in my acquisition transactions. But now I want to add the PO and the check and the account code to it. I could extract that out, add that information in, and then use the acquisition import type to load that in, checking update records, and it will then go and update those existing acquisitions. Okay. Same thing with the dispositions. I do want to run through an example of this because I know that you'll probably get a lot of questions on how to mass dispose of items. So in order to dispose of an item, um, the item must exist. So that item has to be out there as active or some type of active status in order to uh, dispose of it. And so uh, what that means is it doesn't remove it. It creates a disposition transaction and it also changes the status of the item from active to disposed of. So um, um, if in order to actually do brand new dispositions, you wanna make sure that your file is in the correct format for dispositions. You would upload that in here. You would select the disposition import type and you'd make sure the update records is unchecked if you're doing brand new dispositions. If you're going in and making changes to existing dispositions, obviously you can check the update records and it will go make those changes. Um, our uh, uh, documentation has the file layout for the disposition uh, import type, it looks very different from the item. It doesn't need all that information. Um, there's just you know a handful of columns and stuff that are needed on that. And so I do want to show you that. So I'm going to go out of here and I'm going to get rid of all of these reports. 
And I'm going to go down to the disposition import type in our documentation. And this is it. So it's not a huge table uh, like it is for items. Um, and so it just tells you what the record ID must be, um, the tag. And you notice it says tag and not inventory tag. So you do have to be careful about the field formatting here. The date of the disposition, of the dis disposition code, these are found underneath core dispositions. So, um, you know, they got existing codes out there, then you wanna make sure that those are the codes that are used. Uh, for your dispos on your disposition spreadsheet. <clears throat> um, authorized by, amount received. Um, if you sold it and you just want to keep track of how much um, you sold it for, um, you can put that in here. And the error adjustment. If this is from um, a prior year, it should have been disposed of last year and it wasn't. Um, you can mark the error adjustment to true so that it shows. And the reason why with any of these error adjustments, it's really meant for the capitalized assets. So if I forgot to dispose of a bus for last year, let's say we sold a bus um, and it was, and we sold it last year. Um, let's say I have a handful of buses, you know, on my spreadsheet, I can mark the error adjustment to true. And what happens then, you know, that was a, that's a capitalized asset. It's going to show up on my gap schedules. But instead of it showing up on the disposition column on my gap schedules, because I selected an error adjustment of true, it's going to show up on my adjustments column on my gap schedules to show that, yeah, I did dispose of this asset this year, but I really should have done it last year. So that's why it's showing up on adjustments, because it's not a true disposition that took place this year. Um, so that's what that error adjustment means when you see that on these different um, uh, file layouts here. And when you're actually creating it manually as well, you'll see that error adjustment flag. Okay, so let's talk about disposing. I've got some Chromebooks. So I received, again, a spreadsheet from the tech department. Don't know what the spreadsheet's going to look like when I get from them, but I know that it has to be in this format with these, at least these, oops, required fields in order for it to get disposed of properly. So I'm gonna pick on, I've got one out here already. Um, let's see, Chromebooks. So this is what I got from the tech department. And so when I compare that with, my file layouts, it doesn't look the same. So I'm gonna to have to do a little bit of cleanup before I can actually save this. So they've got the tag number, obviously, um, but you know, I know it's not tag and a pound sign, is that's not the proper header record for this. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my file layout here. <clears throat> and I've got record ID, um, has to be a K. I'm totally missing that one. And that the tag uh, format should just be tag. So I need to add a column all together. And I'm going to pull that all the way down. Not sure how many I have here. And then the tag should just be tag. Uh, the case, it isn't case sensitive, so I don't have to worry about that. If I flip back, I need a date and a disposition code. So I don't have a date at all. So um, I'm going to put that in here. If I look to, I don't have a description, so I don't need that. So I'm going to use this as date. And I'm going to put in a date in the open period. So I'll pick on 1-01-2022. And I'm going to make sure. And I'm going to copy that down through the whole thing.
And if I look through the rest here, so I've got the record ID, I got the tag, I got the date, I need a code, I need a disposition code. And the name of it is disposition underscore code. And I'm not quite sure. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and look at my disposition codes and let's say it's trade in, which is 05. <clears throat> I make this text. Tains that leading zero. And copy that down. These are all traded in. So now I go back to my file layout and I've got the record ID, the tag, the date, the disposition code. If I want authorized by amount receive and error adjustment on there as well, I can, they aren't required. Um, and so I'm just gonna go back, save some time here. And I'm just gonna get rid of the rest. I don't really need any of this other information that the tech department gave me. So these are my required fields. Those others aren't needed. So, Cross my fingers, this should work. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm first gonna save this as that regular Excel spreadsheet. And now I'm gonna save it as a CSV file. Okay. And so at this point then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back and do a mass dis disposition of these. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to import, upload. The mouse is acting weird here. And this is the CSV file disposed of Chromebooks. And I'm gonna need to change this to disposition. And then these are new. And I'm gonna go ahead and import. See what happens. And it does tell me that the disposition was added. So again, I'm gonna jot down at least this first one. And I scroll down here, looks to be it. So I'm gonna go now and look at that particular dis disposition that was created. And then I will look at the item to make sure that it says disposed of. So 006641. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna go to the item first. <laughs> and um, it tells me right away the status it's been disposed of. So that's good. It updated that automatically. Now I should have a related disposition transaction. So I'm gonna go down to dispositions. And there it is. And again, if I want to view this, I know this is something we're working on here um, or, you know, or we're aware of this and it's not showing the item on here. Um, but everything else looks good. I said it was a disposition code of 05, which is a trade-in. Um, I didn't have any other information. I didn't have an authorized buy. The cost disposed of is pulling it from the original cost. I had, and I could add an extra one for, amount received if I wanted to, with my trade-in value, I could put that in there. But otherwise, this comes automatically from the item. So does this, it was only one item. And then obviously the fund function and asset comes from the item as well. So again, if this was a capitalized asset, which this is definitely under the threshold, so it's not, I could run, if it was capitalized, I run a gap uh, report like the change schedule, the schedule of changes in fixed assets. This amount would be included under the disposed of column on that uh, report. Okay. Any questions on dis mass disposing of items? So I think, you know, a lot of this is 
in this particular case, um, when you're trying to dispose of existing items or update existing items, let the grids do the work. Um, when it be when it comes um, for new items, you know it's probably going to spend a little more time in that worksheet, right? In that spreadsheet, getting things set up. Um, so that might you know um, take a little more time. But otherwise, all these other ones where you're trying to either dispose of assets or edit existing assets, like I said, go to that particular items grid, filter, and do the export grid items to save you a lot of time. It has everything in there you need. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about, and I'm not going to get into step-by-step -step on this because that could be a separate session itself. Um, I just want to explain what the non-migration import is. For those of you that maybe, you know, all of our districts that were on Classic and that wanted to migrate did, right? That's, that's done. Um, but like I said, you may have some districts that they weren't using the EIS system, or maybe they just were, but they're, they weren't ready to migrate because maybe their classic system wasn't up to where it needed to be. So um, they now may be ready to start using inventory. So when it comes to that, you want to follow these non-migration import steps in order to migrate them. Um, this actual non-migration import option is only available to admin roles. Your districts do not have access to this. Um, I kind of call this like a uh, data tree and the EIS import admin access all rolled into one. Um, it could be pretty dangerous. Um, so obviously that's why it's just for ITC staff to control. Um, the actual steps, all of the steps to migrate are included in this link. So you need to set up the instance and get that ready ahead of time. Make sure you've got information entered in there before you start entering a spreadsheet of all of that data from all of those years and import it in. So this includes, this link includes all the steps to get to that point where you're ready and your instance is ready for you to start mass importing data. Um, when it comes to that, you are going to use this migration import option underneath the system configuration menu. So you are going to use those import file layouts underneath the system import to help you get those set up. Um, but um, you're definitely going to use the migration import option to actually import them because, like I said, these items are going to have acquisition dates from years and years ago. And so, you know, they got a building they created, you know, built 1975. It's still a building in use. Um, they have it on their spreadsheet, you know, worth, you know, millions of dollars that needs to be imported in. Well, their um, instance is set up for 2024. If they try to use the system import option, it's not going to let them because it's not in fiscal year 1975. Um, so that's why you have to use the migration import to import all those archived um, items. Um, with that, only CSV file formatted files again. Um, you can only select one import file at a time. So these are kind of the three ways to import. And it totally depends on your district and what they want to import. I've come across tickets where they just want to import items and create one acquisition record against that one item and be done. I've come across tickets where not only do they want to create the items, they have multiple acquisitions against each item. How do I get all of those in there? That's where this acquisition import type comes into play. And then they also, some of them just want, I just want to create an instance with my active items. There are others who say, I want to create an instance with all my active and disposed of. So we've got this disposition import type, 
to handle importing of disposed of assets. So we kind of thought of everything, you know, that they could want. Um, but I think the majority of them go with option A here and just say, listen, I just want to create an item, have my associated acquisition. Yeah, I may want to pull those acquisitions out afterwards, extract them out and add maybe the purchase order and stuff to them and then update those. But I just want one acquisition per item. So that's kind of the cleanest way to do it. Um, and one other thing to keep in mind too, when you're creating these, any core codes um, that are on the spreadsheet that do not currently exist under their core menu yet, um, those will be automatically created. So that's nice. It saves time. But the one thing to keep, if they don't want to do the core setup beforehand, um, but one thing to keep in mind with that, though, is that the descriptions tied to those core codes will be stated user imported. So they will need to extract those out or go in, you know, if there aren't that many, they only have four function, you know, codes, they can go into core, edit those and enter in the correct description on those. I think the one maybe that they want to probably do in a spreadsheet is probably locations because there could be a lot of them. So again, just going over those options for a non-migrated district that's now interested in using inventory. If this district only needs one item and one acquisition per item, in our documentation there under the um, non-migration import option, um, the uh, migration import option, I'm sorry. Um, we have a mass importing items with one acquisition step. So this basically involves one CSV file with all the item information. They will be using the item file layout as a guide, as a template. And they're going to create all of those, uh, enter all those items in from all of those years onto that spreadsheet. And then when they're ready, they're going to use the migration import to load it in. I go back here. Here's our migration import menu. So they pull the CSV file in here, select item, check mark to create the acquisition records, import it in, and it's only going to create one item and one acquisition per item. And it will up you know, they go out to the items grid afterwards and they'll see all those items from 1975 on that they wanted to include in their inventory. If a district needs one item, but they have several acquisitions, they want to itemize their acquisitions per item, then you're going to follow the mass importing items with multiple acquisition steps. That's in our documentation. It's going to include importing an item CSV file and an acquisition CSV file. The key is the acquisition CSV file must be imported first and then the item file. What happens then, end result, they'll have a bunch of items out there. And if I go and look at one of those items, their acquisition records, they could have five acquisition records against that one item. So that's what this process will do. And then the last one is if they want to mass import disposition records, some of them do. Um, I know most of them just say, I just want my active stuff. I'll dispose of stuff once I start on inventory, right? But there are some that want to um, pull in their disposition transactions. If they want that, then they're going to follow um, for those disposed of assets, they're going to follow this option of mass importing items with associated dispositions. This is going to involve their item CSV file and a disposition CSV file. They're going to create the item record first and the acquisition that's tied to that item. So there's one item, one acquisition. So that's out there, but 
the on the item record, it's going to have a status of disposed of, not active, okay? So it's setting that up then for them then to go in, import their disposition CSV file. So now the disposition's out there against that disposed of asset. So I hope that helps explain these different non-migration options. But um, like I said, these are listed out there and I'm gonna go, I know I have links here on the PowerPoint, but where these are actually at, when I, right now I'm underneath the import, I wanna go to configuration settings, migration import, and these options with these steps are right here. So I basically summarize those on that spread on that PowerPoint. But that's where these are at. We've had a couple successful ones. Um, every once in a while we get a ticket. I know we have a ticket right now with somebody about not being able to see their fiscal year. So I know they're working on that. They're getting the log. We're not quite sure what's going on with that. They try to get to the fiscal year after they did the non-migration steps and um, they can't access the fiscal year, they get an error. So it's an odd error. It's something we haven't seen before. So we're looking into that. Okay, go back. Any questions about our import steps and our non-migration import steps? And a scan in the chat to see if there's anything else. Okay. If not, we probably made your head spin way longer than what we should have gone through. But, I, you know, it's some good information about imports. Um, you know, future inventory trainings, and this will probably be more for calendar year 24. Um, these are just some suggestions that I had um, beginning any balances. We've had tickets come in right now and we're looking into those. I know we've got some stuff that uh, we're looking into. Our developers are looking into balancing differences between beginning and ending. But um, I, I felt like this might be a good session to go through, you know, next year, maybe closer to uh, the end of the uh, fiscal year to go through stuff and talk more about beginning and ending balances. I think it would be helpful every year to talk about that stuff um, and just have a refresher course. So that's definitely one that I thought would be good. Um, changes in capitalization statuses on items. I thought that might be a good topic to talk about, but I'll let you guys think on it. And if there are um, suggestions that you would like, um, I'm planning on getting a survey out um, to the ITCs here, hopefully here within the next month or so, um, about uh, topics for next year for our Fridays with Fiscal. And so obviously these will be included on the inventory portion of them, but you'll have an option too to fill in your suggestions so that we can kind of organize those and get our schedule ready for the new year because it's going to be here before you know it. So, okay, um, just to recap what we're, or to talk about what's happening um, in the next couple of weeks here. We've got September uh, release recap will be on October 6th. We have canceled our system menu um, that we were going to do October 13th. We have a management council uh, in-person meeting that day. And so um, what I have done though is we went over this, um, well, Mark and Jody and Matt covered the system menu information in detail at the OECN United Conference last March, and I included their PowerPoint in here um, so that you guys can uh, refer to that. Um, Mid-October, uh, we're gonna be, Amanda's gonna be talking about account filter options and how they affect reports. And then we're rolling right into November and uh, close to our calendar year end review. So if you guys don't have any further questions, um, I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend and uh, we'll see you guys soon.